Right, if you've got a Bible there, can you uh, turn with me to uh, the book of John? I'm just going to pray for us. I'm going to pray for us very quickly. Lord, we want to thank you, God, for this morning. We want to thank you for your word. God, I want to thank you that, Father, we are not looking at the Woman's Day or Woman's Weekly or The Guardian. We're not reading something out of Fox News. God, we are looking at a word that is living, a word that is active, a word that penetrates, divides our soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the intentions of our heart this morning, God. Jesus, you said that, 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 that Lord, your word is spirit and it's life. And God, that's what, how we want to approach this this morning, Father. So I pray, each of us here, would you open our ears to hear what the Holy Spirit might want to say to each of us individually on the place we are in our journey. Open our eyes to see something new that you want us to see today, Father. And Holy Spirit, would you uh, just do a work inside of us, Lord? We want to grow in our understanding of who God is. We want to grow in our understanding of who we are. And Father, we want to be better, uh, stronger disciples of Jesus Christ in the day and the age that you have strategically placed us to make a difference. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said... Amen. If you've got a Bible there, turn with me to John chapter 8. Before we do, I heard a story, and I just want to share a story with you. Rod, you'll love this. You were probably one of the guys in the story. Two guys were trying to escape from a lunatic asylum. Yeah. Actually, now that I'm saying this, can I say that in church? There's so many things you can't say now. If you are a lunatic, I'm not having a go at you. Please, it's not a personal attack. It's just a joke. I'm happy to change it. Two lunatics were trying to escape from a church. You can say that because you can say anything about churches, that's fine. So two lunatics were trying to escape from an asylum. One night, uh, they decide they don't like living there anymore, they're going to break out. So they get up onto the roof and there's this narrow gap between where they are and the, the uh, 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 means of escape. It's the rooftops of some of the houses in town. So one of the guys, he goes back and takes a run up and he jumps and he leaps and he gets across the uh, thing, lands on the other side, stands up. And then he turns around to his mate and says, come jump. And his mate looks over the edge and his mate goes, look, I can't do it. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to fall and I'm going to hurt myself. And so his other buddy says to him, look, I've got an idea. I've got a torch here. I'm going to turn the torch on and shine it across the gap and you can walk across the beam of the torch. And the other guy goes, what do you think I am, crazy? You'll turn it off when I'm halfway there. <laughs> now, what does that have to do with my message? I'm trying to tie it in somehow. I just thought it was a good gag. But truth is something solid that we can stand on. Amen. How many of you know that truth matters? Truth matters. Truth, truth is that which corresponds to reality, something that is real. And if you're a Christian in this place, um, and if you're not, that's completely fine. I, I, if you're on a journey or checking us out, it's great to have you with us. If you want to know about Jesus, please don't go to Google. Go and talk to somebody that is following Jesus or get your hands on a collection of ancient documents that we call a Bible or go along to a church. That's the best way to find out about Jesus. So if that's you, I'm glad you're here this morning. Truth is that which corresponds to reality, but for us as Christians, we have, I guess, a little bit of a different view of reality, because we don't just tie ourselves to the see, taste, touch, feel, smell world, amen? We understand there's more to life than what we can interact with in our natural senses and so on. There's another side of life. And we also understand that Jesus is reality, that what God says and how God sees things is way more real than the way I see things or the way I feel or what I think. We've got to consistently, as believers, keep tying ourselves back to this collection of ancient documents that we call a Bible. We've got to keep coming back to what does this say. This has got to shape our worldview. This has got to shape the way that we see God, our perspective of God. It's got to shape the way we see ourselves. Uh, so often we let culture shape the way we see God. We even let culture tell us how we should interpret this collection of ancient documents, instead of realising that everything that was written here was saying something to somebody at some point. They were hearing something. When this was written, the people it was written to heard a particular thing back then. And we don't, we don't have the right to change what's being heard when we read that out just because culture and the world has changed. So it's really, really important that we understand that as believers we have a standard of truth and that standard of truth is the Word of God. In, in, in John chapter 8... Verse 30 to 32, Jesus made this statement. He's just finished speaking to a bunch of people and a bunch of, of, of people believed him. Uh, in verse 30, it says, as he spoke these words, many believed in him. A lot of people believed in Jesus. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you will do something. He says, you will know 
the truth. But then he goes on further and says, there's, there's a reason why it's really important to know truth. He says, because it's truth that's going to set you free. It's truth that's going to set you free. Now, Jesus is talking here to a Jewish audience. Jewish thought characterized God as truth. If you spoke to a Jew back in Jesus' day and you said, what is truth? The Jewish mind would say, God is truth. God is truth. You speak to people today, what is truth? We live in a world with relative and subjective truth, isn't it? Truth is, you know, whatever I think it is or whatever I feel or so on. And, and, and if truth really is something that corresponds to reality and both our truths are opposite, they probably can't both be right. But we live in such a hazy world today that, that, that it seems like logic has been thrown out the window and, 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 and truth doesn't really matter so much about what truth actually is. It's what you feel about truth. But as believers, we have a set of truth. And, and these Jewish people, when they heard Jesus say the truth will set you free, they understood truth to be God. God could set you free. He goes, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you abide, it means uh, if you continue. That word in the Greek means continue. If you continue in my word. A lot of people just start, don't they? And then they stop, and then they don't go any further with it. This same group of believers, if you actually fast forward and get to the end of John chapter 8, this same group of people who it says, and then they believed in him, by the end of it, when he continues to give them truth, they're picking up stones to kill him. This same group that it says they believed in Jesus, he then begins to unpack some truth to them. They don't like that truth. And so by the end of the passage, they are standing there. It's weird, isn't it? These, these are people that believed in him that in a very short period of time are picking up stones to throw at him. Why? Because he just unpacked a bit of truth. He spoke a little bit of truth to them. And it got them so angry. Remember that old, there was a prophet many years ago, Jacques Nicholson. You can't handle the truth. Remember that movie? He wasn't a prophet. It was Jack Nicholson. It was just an attempt to bring him into some sort of biblical narrative. And it's true. Some of us can't handle the truth. And here's a group of people that couldn't handle the truth. But Jesus has just told them, you need to learn to handle truth. Why? Because that's how you're going to get free. I'm not, I'm not giving you truth to hurt you. I'm not giving you truth to shame you. I'm not giving you truth to humiliate you. I'm not giving you truth to belittle you. I'm giving you truth for one reason. I want you free. I want to see you freer than you could ever want to see yourself free. And the way I'm going to get you there is I've got to give you the truth. Amen? Amen? And so Jesus gives them truth. They don't know what to do with that. And so they, they drift away. So so important that we receive truth and that we understand truth, that we know truth, because that truth is one of the vehicles which God will use to bring freedom into your life today. But a lot of people would say, I know the truth, but I'm not experiencing freedom. And I'll guarantee in this room, there's a lot of people here and you might have been reading and and, and you might know all the stuff. Anyone know people that know all the stuff? But they don't really know all the stuff. They know all the stuff, but they don't know the one that all the stuff's pointing them to and talking about. And we can know a lot of stuff about God. We can know a lot of truth, but there's a gap between knowing truth in our head and walking in the experience of what that truth is meant to produce, which is freedom. Freedom. God wants us to be free. What I want to do today is is have a little bit of look at truth, and then I want to walk through the mechanics of, 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 of how this works. All right. To start with, I want to give you two Greek words. In the New Testament, there are two primary Greek words for truth. One is the word oida, and the other one is the word gnosko. I think I've got them up there. Have I got a slide there somewhere? These two Greek words are used interchangeably throughout the New Testament, right? Um, And there's a lot of similarities between these two words, but there's one massive big difference between these two Greek words. And and the simplest way I can put it is this. To break it down into a simple term is this, that uh, oida is a knowledge of facts. Now, if I said to you, Four plus four equals, what would you say? Are you sure about that? Is there anybody here that came up with a different number? You've had a different life experience. Maybe you went to a different school. Maybe they taught something different. I don't know. Anybody want to dispute four plus four equals eight this morning? Anybody? No. Good. Because when I was getting this ready, I thought someone's going to say it, and I'm going to look at them and go, wow, I can't believe, you know. But you didn't. So well done. So if I say four plus four equals eight, then that's a fact. Now, here's the thing about oida. That's it. 
That's the totality of the knowledge you need about four plus four equals eight. You can't add anything to that piece of knowledge. It simply is what it is. You can't add to it, and that's all there is to know about it. That's oida. Now, the second word that's used for know is gnosko. Gnosko is a different type of knowing, where oida is a knowledge of facts, four plus four equals eight. Gnosko is more a knowledge of experience. The best way I can describe it to you is that it's, an, it's like oida is knowing facts. Knowledge is like knowing a person. It's like knowing a person. And what I mean by that is this. You don't just know facts about your friends. You know them by experience, don't you? You've walked with them. You've talked with them. You've joked with them. Someone didn't just say that that lady there is Jackie. She's 50. She, her hair is this color. She weighs this. She wears glasses. She's good at this. Good, and that's it. And you go away and go, I really know Jackie. No, you don't really know Jackie the way that Gnosko is talking about. You've got to meet Jackie and interact with Jackie. It's not just about the facts. It's about knowing them by experience. And the difference with this type of knowledge is that this type of knowledge takes time to gain. It takes time to gain. Time of being together. It takes time to gain. It's never complete. I'm always, I've, I've been married to Jackie now for 20, 20, nearly 30 years. Nearly 30 years we've been married. And uh, every day I feel like I'm learning. I know, you can you believe it? We're still there. So, and every day we're learning more and more things about each other, subtle little nuances and stuff. Because as we experience new things together, we learn new things about each other and so on. So it's this knowledge that's not just linear, four plus four equals eight. It's an ever-expanding knowledge. It's a knowledge that takes time. It's never complete. It's an unfolding revelation of one another. That's what it is. That's what it means to know in the Gnosko way. The New Testament calls us to a knowledge of God that involves an ongoing, ever-expanding experience of God in our lives. This word here, Jesus said you would know the truth. It's the word gnosko. You would know the truth. You would experience the truth. You would have an ever-unfolding, expanding revelation and understanding of the truth. Now, sometimes when you talk about experience with God, it can twist people's minds a little bit. It can bend their mind a little bit. What do you mean? Because we don't live by experiences, do we? We don't chase experiences. But we cannot change the reality that when we come to know God, that there is an expectation of some type of experience. We're called to bear fruit. How many of you know that we're called to bear fruit? Well, the bearing of fruit is an experience. I've never seen a tree that bears fruit, but you don't see the fruit, but it's bearing fruit, but there's never a fruit. And if there is fruit, there's a process, something's happening. Sap and water and nutrients are going through the vine and out on the limb and then the little thing. There's some type of experience there. You can't say there's no experience. It's just a oida fact that trees bear fruit. Well, it might be a fact, but it's also an experience. They bear fruit. We're bestowed with gifts to use. God has given us gifts and talents and things to use. When we step into that stuff, it's, it's, it's an experience. Who would deny that, that being used by... There's an experiential side to it. It's not just all about facts and four plus four equals eight. Jesus said that my sheep will hear my voice. Hey, that's an experience. When my wife speaks and I hear her voice, that's an actual experience. Something experiential has happened. It's not just facts and figures and it, it's something going on here. The Bible says that the Spirit leads us, that we're guided by the Holy Spirit. That's an experience, is it not? Somebody leading you, taking you somewhere, speaking to you. There's, there's an experiential side to our faith that we can't deny unless, of course, we want to move away from the truth of what these ancient documents teach us. So what I want to do today, I want to break down the mechanics of how we come to know God in this particular way as the Bible talks about. The mechanics of how we come to know God in a way that the New Testament writers presumed that the hearers would understand when Jesus said something like, you will know the truth, i.e. you will experience the truth, and that experience will free you. Okay? Here's the mechanics of it, as best as I can understand it. Number one, be consistently exposed to truth. Be consistently exposed to truth. You've got to position yourself to hear God's truth on a consistent basis basis, on a consistent basis. When I was younger, I used to surf a lot, lived down in Bowler and I, was, I, I used to surf. Don't, I've got drop foot now, so I, I, I don't do it so much anymore. Plus, these big animals with fins started biting people, so I got out of the water in a hurry. But um, 
When I used to go surfing, there would be times you would sit there and there would be this, the, the, the wave would peak at a certain point and there's like 50 guys all sitting there jostling and battling to see who can get right of passage on that wave. But there would always be three or four guys sitting way over there and while the waves are rolling in and you're getting a wave and paddling and getting on, there'd be guys sitting over there looking all the time thinking, how, how, how come they're getting all the waves? Well, I'm sorry, but you're sitting in a place where there's a, no waves. You're sitting in a flat patch where there's a bit of reef right there. No water's jacking up. There's no wave to catch. The problem is not the wave. The problem is you're not positioning yourself to catch the wave. You've got to position yourself if you want to catch a wave. If you go fishing, do not bait up a hook and drop it in your swimming pool or your bathtub. You probably won't catch anything. Go to a river or the beach or a wall. You've got to position yourself in the right place if you want to catch a fish. Well, if you want to be consistently exposed to the Word of God and the teachings of truth, you have to take the initiative and consistently position yourself. I can think of no better way to consistently position myself to hear the truths of God than to come along to a gathering of other believers on, on a Sunday. I, I do not believe that if you don't come to church on Sunday, you're not saved. I've never believed that. I don't care how you do it. Just get with other believers and get into these ancient documents and this Word of God. Um, uh, have a regular Bible reading pattern in your life. Get out of bed in the morning or if you're an evening person, do it at night. Just spend, I don't care if it's five minutes a day. Get into truth. Because here's the thing. The truth that the world wants to throw at you, you don't have to do anything to be inundated with that because it's coming at you from every angle. But if you want to get the truth of God inside of you, you have to take deliberate time and effort to make that happen. And if you don't, make deliberate time and effort and position yourself for that to happen, then the truth that's primarily going to be coming into your ears is going to be a different kind of truth and it won't be the truth of God. We've got to position ourselves and be in the right place in order to be exposed consistently to the truths of what God is saying. But how many of you know exposure is not enough? Next Sunday morning, there are going to be millions of people around the world exposed to the truth of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. So step one is to consistently expose ourselves to truth, but it goes on from there. Remember, we're talking about knowing, experiencing truth. What are the mechanics of experiencing truth? Well, number one, consistently expose yourself to truth. Number two is then you've got to start to believe that truth that you're consistently exposing yourself to. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary definition of believe says this. It says, to consider to be true or honest. The Cambridge Dictionary says, to think that something is true, correct, or real. Encyclopedia Britannica says to accept or regard something as true. Here's, here's the truth. doesn't matter what angle you look at it from truth. Belief does not require feelings. It requires more of a choice. Belief is not about feelings. There are a lot of things I don't feel that I know are true. Amen? How many of you wake up every day and you just feel Loved by God all the time. But we know it's true, right? How many of you husbands and wives wake up and some mornings your wife forgot to make you a coffee and you don't feel like being married anymore? But you are and you will. And you know what I'm saying? We, 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 we're so accustomed, we're drip fed to live by feelings. But if we live by feelings, I've said it before, I would have had a tattoo of Mickey Mouse on my face at four and I would have regretted it by the time I was 12. But we don't live by feelings and make decisions by feelings. There was an article in Psychology Today, September 2022, by a guy called Michael Austin. And he said this. He says, Authentic belief is influenced by many things, such as environmental factors. But what is most important is our view of the available evidence for or against a belief. What is most important is your view, your perspective of the evidence that is available. In other words, again, he's saying it's not about feelings. It's about get, being consistent in the truth and looking at that truth and, in, and, and, and thinking about and engaging with that truth in order to come to a decision what is true and what is not. How real and honest do you think Jesus Christ was when he said the things that he said? What do you think about the teachings of Jesus? What do you think about those things? You know, the truth is for a lot of people, they actually don't think about them. It's just a reality. We've got so many things that we've got to think about in life. So many decisions to be made. So many voices yelling and screaming at us. 
But what we know about belief is that belief is not so much a choice. It's a decision based on the available evidence. Well, if we spend no time in God's side of, of, of evidential truth, if we don't know any of this stuff, how can we factor that into the choice and the decision that we make? And before you know it, we get a degree off here and a degree off there. And before you know it, we're way, way off here. It's interesting when you read the New Testament, how many of the letters, the writings of Paul, where he, he, he says, you know, I turned up, we preached the gospel, you believed, you started following me, but then he, said, he, he says there are false prophets or false teachers, whatever, came in. And usually a false teacher does not come in and give an opposing view of this. Usually what they do is they'll take that central truth, they'll go one step from there and turn that into the central truth and idea. And then when you do that, you only got to go one more step away from and before you know it, you've changed the whole central truth and the whole idea. They weren't just always coming in. Uh, 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 heresy and this sort of stuff doesn't just happen. Little. Usually they don't come on in and go, hey, I just want to let you know I'm a false teacher and what I'm going to tell you is a lie, but I really hope you believe me. They don't do that. It just, it's truth that gets drip-fed to us that pulls us away from the centrality of the truth that God says, this is the truth that will set you free. Now, if Jesus' truth sets me free, I've got a theory. I grew up outside of a Christian home with no Bibles in my house, never went to church, none of that stuff. And let me tell you, by 19 years of age, I'd heard a lot of truth. That truth bound me up. None of that truth set me free. It wasn't until 19 years of age I bowed my knee to Jesus, I heard the gospel story, decided that I think you're real and I'm going to follow after you, and I started getting into the truth of God's word, seeing truth as God saw it, that then I began to feel chains breaking off me, things being unpacked, doors being opened, and I began to walk in truth. And one thing I'm very firm on is the truth of the world won't always set you free. God's word will always set you free. God's truth will always set you free because God wants his children free. It's the heart of a father. So how do we come to actually believe that truth? Well, there's a great, I'm glad you asked, Acts chapter 17, verse 10 to 12. There's this great little narrative, and we're going we're gonna to talk, this is what I want to talk with the young people about tonight. It says, Then the, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more, listen to this, these, as in the, 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 these people here, these Bereans, they were more fair-minded or noble-minded, it says. More noble-minded than the Thessalonians. In other words, I'm here preaching in a rise today, and you are more fair-minded than the church I preached in yesterday. That's what he's basically saying. I preached in this church, but there was something about this second group that made them more noble-minded, more fair-minded than the other one. And it says they were more fair-minded. Why? It says because they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks and prominent women as well as men. It says that in verse 4 that many of the Thessalonians believed. But then it goes on and says, but the Bereans also believed. But what was the difference? These guys just maybe believed, they heard and they believed. But this other group, it says, they didn't just believe because I said it. They dove into these scriptures and went, I'm going to make sure that there's a foundation for this truth. I'm not going to believe it just because Paul tells me. I'm going to go back into here because Paul is not the standard of truth. The scriptures are, that what God says is the standard of truth. So I'm going to dive into that. I'm going to make sure that what Paul says lines up with that because if I do, then I can build my, my, my faith in that. I can start to believe that because it actually is truth. It's not somebody's truth. This is actually truth as God sees truth, the kind of truth that sets you free. They didn't just get up and walk away. Here's what the Bereans did. They received and they wrestled. They received and they wrestled. They received what Paul said and they wrestled with it. And here's what I think. If you receive and wrestle, you'll get revelation. If you receive the word of God and you wrestle with it, it will take you to a point of revelation. Whether you say, yes, I believe it or no, I don't is irrelevant. But if you receive the word of God and you wrestle with the word of God, you'll set yourself up to be the kind of person that gets revelation from the word of God. So we need to come to a place of believing before we can step into the next phase. So we expose ourselves to truth consistently. Then we begin to believe truth. Once we start believing truth, now we've got to walk in the truth. Got to walk in the truth. 3 John 1 verse 2 to 4. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. For I rejoiced greatly when brothers came and testified of the truth that's in you just as you what? Walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children Walk in the truth. So we're exposing ourselves consistently to truth. Then we're wrestling with it, receiving, wrestling, getting revelation. We're believing truth. Now, once we believe it, now we've got to get up and we've got to actually start living it. Whether we feel like it or not, we start living in truth. We start walking in truth. A great example is Romans chapter 6. 
and uh, verse 11. Paul writes this, after going through, you can read it in your own time, he goes through and he says, you've been uh, crucified with Christ, you've been resurrected. He speaks about all this stuff. Now, the hearers know, 2,000 years ago, I was not on a cross physically with him. I wasn't in a tomb with him. I didn't raise up with him. But Paul's saying spiritually, yes, you did. He's saying, I want you to see something that your, your see, taste, touch, feel senses are not going to convince you of and, and lead you to believe. But I'm telling you, here's the truth. And he goes on and he, he associates them with Christ. Then he says in verse 11, likewise, because of all of this, reckon yourself to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The, the, the New Living Translation says, so you should also consider yourself to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God in Christ. NIV says in the same way, count yourself. It doesn't matter which angle you look at it. That word where he says reckon, what it literally means is you need to now start to see yourself this way. You need to start to see yourself now this way. As somebody that was literally crucified with Christ, your old nature has been done with. You have been buried. You have been raised to newness of life. You need to start to see yourself that way. Some of us, we need to see it before we'll ever be it. And the problem is we don't see it We see something else and we keep seeing that about ourselves and we keep believing that and we keep being that. Paul's saying here that here's the truth. Now your part now is is I've exposed you to truth. You've got to believe that truth. Now you've got to actually get up and walk as if that truth is true. Amen? You've got to be exposed to truth. Then you've got to believe truth. Then you've got to stand up and you've got to walk in truth. And when you start walking in truth, then... Then you begin to experience or gnosko, you begin to know truth. Now the problem here is that most people want to bypass the second and the third point. We want to be exposed to truth and then we want to experience truth. That's, that's the reality. Tell me how it is and make me feel it. Tell me how it is and make it happen. But it doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible do you see the mechanics of knowledge of gnosko, of experiencing truth, being simply just expose yourself and then it's always just going to happen for you. But isn't that the world we live in, hey? We just want everything easy, everything on a plate, everything instant. But it doesn't work like that and that's what uh, uh, Jesus is saying here when he says you'll know truth. He says you'll know truth, but, but the way that you're going to know truth is first you've got to expose yourself consistently to it. Then you've got to wrestle with it to get revelation and start to believe it. Then you've got to get up and you've got to walk in it. And when you do those things, then you are going to experience something of God in your life. You are going to start to experience freedom. In other words, you've got to almost walk in it and believe it, even though your feelings are telling you everything other than. But as you do that, then you'll begin to experience all this stuff that God wants you to experience. And most of us, we don't want the second point. We don't want to have to wrestle with it and engage with it, and we don't want to have to come to a point of believing, then we don't want to walk in it. We just want to go from exposure to experience. So if we break that down, John chapter 8, verse 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, means continue. What's he saying? If you are consistently exposed to truth. He says, then you're my disciples indeed. You're my apprentices. What's, well, well, can you imagine an apprentice saying to the person, and, and that's the best New Testament analogy we have to the ancient term discipleship, is apprentice. Anyone an apprentice here? Any apprentices here? No? Anyone got an apprentice here? No? Can you imagine an apprentice saying to the, the, the you know, when, when they're told to go and get the left-handed screwdriver, now, that's a bad analogy. Cause, but can you imagine Ben Luca? Where's Ben? Where's Benny here? Electrician. Can you imagine Ben having an apprentice? And, but, but, but he calls himself an apprentice. But he, and my wife's your apprentice. But, but, but she doesn't do anything you tell her to do. She doesn't believe anything you say. Well, you're not an apprentice. <laughs> you're just a Klingon who's hanging around an electrician. You're like a drummer in a band. You're just hanging around. Old musician's joke, what do you call a drummer? <laughs> no, you're amazing, Ben. I, I love your drumming. And, and, and Clint, don't let that scare you. So he says this, he says, If you abide in my word, exposed consistently to truth, you're my disciples indeed. Disciples believe the truth, they walk in the truth, and you'll know the truth, which means you'll then experience it. And when you experience the truth, you will be what? Set free the truth will set you free it's the truth you know the truth you experience that unlocks the door to your potential freedom in God the truth that you know the truth that you experience that unlocks the door the truth that you are first exposed to then you come to believe then you walk in 
then you begin to experience. That's the process and the mechanics of the kind of freedom and knowing that the New Testament talks about when it says you will know God, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let me finish with one passage that I'll guarantee, if you've been brought up in church, you've memorized this verse. One of the most memorized verses in the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. And this displays the mechanics of this so incredibly well. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. What's it talking about? Exposure. It's going to be there all the time. But you'll meditate in it day and night. What are we doing? We're wrestling with it. <clears throat> we're receiving and we're wrestling. And then revelation's going to come. You'll believe. That you may observe to do. Then once you've wrestled and, and you've believed, what are you going to do? You're going to actually do it. I know it sounds boring. But this Christian life requires us to do some things, doesn't it? I wish God would do it all for us. I just wish that he would do everything and I could just watch football and, and swim in a pool. And go, but, but we're required to actually do the stuff according to all that's written in it. And then what happens at the end of it? Then, then once you've been exposed, once you've believed enough to walk in it, then you'll make your way prosperous, then you'll have good success. In other words, then, at the back end of that process, then you'll begin to experience. Who wants to actually experience God in their Christianity? Yeah? I don't want to just know facts about God. I know facts coming out my ears about God. I want to experience God. When, when, when God wanted to redeem mankind, he did not go, I've got a... Jackie, take that. He didn't send a book and say, study hard, learn all the stuff. He, he sent down uh, 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 his son, Jesus Christ, so that man could experience God. Amen? God just doesn't want us to know stuff about him. He wants us to experience him. But we have to want to experience him. We have to expose ourselves to the point of belief. And what we believe, we get up and we walk in, and then we open ourselves up to those encounters and experiences with God. I'm going to make it very practical this morning. Let's get the guys to come back up. We're going to finish up um, this morning. Why don't you lead us in, I surrender. Surrender all again. That's a good song to finish with this morning. Here's what, I'm, here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to open up the front. And we, we, I'm going to ask you if you feel like the Holy Spirit's speaking to you. you you'd like prayer. I, I want to invite you to come forward this morning. We want to pray for you. You know, if you're sick, how many of you, if, 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 if you're sick? Uh, uh, there's not James. Remember, James is a great dude. James wrote some great stuff in his book. If you haven't read it, read it. And James, in his letter, he says these things like, if anyone's sick among you, you know, call the elders of the church, get them to lay hands on you and to pray over you. I I, I believe that not just elders praying, I believe you can pray for each other and you can see healing and you can see the Holy Spirit move and you can can see all this stuff happen. Our, Our faith is not about Sunday. Sunday, when I come here, Sunday, my prayer. When we go out the back there, before any of you turn up, a bunch of us go out the back there and we pray. And our prayer always ends with, God, I want to thank you for the things that you are going to do today. Because, God, we believe that you're going to do stuff. I I don't believe that God just wants us to sit, fill out filing cabinets of our head with another couple of scriptures this week, walk away from here, and guaranteed by the time you get out of your car, most of us have forgot it anyway. I forgot a lot of information I've learned about God through my Bible college days and my YWAM days and so on. I forgot a lot of things I've heard about God, a lot of knowledge. But let me tell you something. When, When God has encountered my world, those experiences become a part of my story. That's where Casper the Friendly Ghost actually becomes God. He becomes real and personal to us. So we're going to just sing this song to finish. Uh, if you feel like the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you, I'd love you to come forward this morning. We would love to pray with you. Uh, we've got you know, people here. If you're a regular attender here at Arise, feel free to come on up and, and pray for people as they, as they come forward. Uh, we would love to pray with you. I uh, believe that God has more for us than just a bunch of information. Amen. Who believes that? Who believes that? He's got more than information for you. I love my children. And I don't want to just sit there and tell them. I don't want to send them letters that say, I love you, I love you. I want to be with them. And I want to somehow, through the way I interact with them, even when they make me angry, I'm still thinking, how can I still interact through this moment and still let them know that, you know what? You're still so precious and special to me. Even though I want to thump you sideways right now but I still love them. I want them to experience, feel that. And that's our Heavenly Father this morning. Amen. And I think that's what the world wants. I don't think the world is waiting for more information about God. The world's not waiting to hear another scripture passage. They're not waiting to have somebody come and, you know, and I've got nothing against all that. I'm, I'm a big believer. I told you today, truth. I'll stick to the Word of God. I'll preach the Word of God. But it's got to lead me to knowing the truth, which means experiencing the truth. And that truth is going to have an impact, an experiential impact in my life and begin to set me free. 
when that truth sets me free, I've got another testimony. Remember that? They overcame by the blood of the Lamb, what Jesus did on the cross. But there's a second way we overcome too. The word of our own testimony. God has been good to me. And here's what He's done. God healed me. God set me free. God spoke truth to me when I didn't want to hear it. But He was right. I laid my life down, gave it to Him. He said, if you, if, you, if, you, if you die, you'll live. So I did. I died to myself. And I can testify now my own experience. I'm living like I've never lived before. Amen. Holy Spirit, I just thank you for your presence with us right now, Lord. God, we thank you for the truth of your word. God, we thank you for who you are, God. And Father, I pray for each of us in this room now, Lord. Do not let us get up and just walk away if you have been speaking to our hearts. Lord, if you have been speaking to us, I pray right now in this space, in this moment, Lord, would you do surgery? God, would you stir us up? Holy Spirit, stir us up to do something with what you've been speaking to us, Lord, to, to, to reach out to somebody, to get prayer, to come forward, to, to, to lean to the person next to us and go, hey, can I pray for you? Do you feel like the Lord's saying something to you? Whatever it is, God. Lord, don't let people walk out of here this morning without encountering and doing business with you, Father. We want to be conformed into the image of your Son from the heart, from the inside out. In Jesus' name. Everybody said...